In the summer of 2015, a search crew took to the Caribbean Sea aboard a naval vessel, embarking on a secretive mission to find the San Jose, a 300-year-old sunken ship with treasures on board valued at $17 billion. Among the crew was a team of five from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, including Jeff Cayley. My name is Jeff Cayley, and I'm an oceanographic engineer. Our goal is to advance the state of the art in, in underwater technology and help with the storytelling. And this is one of humankind's history's great stories. I'm Doug Frazier, and this is What We Do, a documentary podcast where we'll meet the people behind the most intriguing passions, hobbies, and jobs around the world. So the group I work with at Hui develops and operates what's called an autonomous underwater vehicle, or AUV. It's a torpedo-shaped vehicle that can drive itself. Go! Bridge, AUV descending. The operator might give it some instructions like survey this area or go to this waypoint. That really extends our reach and our ability to, to sample the ocean and find things on the seafloor. There are people there who are you know, videographers, people there from the Colombian government, the Colombian Coast Guard equivalent, and people there from other organizations representing the marine archaeology component. In this field, it is very expensive to maintain and operate a ship and all of its crews. So to come back and say, we have nothing, isn't good enough. You, you, you've got to take, you know, make a, a call when you're out there like, well, we're not observing this phenomenon. Let's, you know, answer this question instead. A lot of times you're making decisions on the fly just to try to take advantage of the time when you're out there to, to bring something home. Having been hired by the Maritime Archaeology Consultants, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, better known as HUI, was on the line. They had embarked on a job that would push their expertise and technology to the limits. The marine archaeologist in charge of the mission had an idea of where the San Jose might be. He created a map with a grid of potential areas off the coast of Colombia. The plan was to search one grid at a time, each of which could take up to two weeks or more to search. You can't send all of the data back. It's just too big. It's like it makes a dial-up modem from the 90s look like really fast. So we don't really get to look at the images uh, that the vehicle's captured until it's back on deck. We've transferred the gigabytes of files over. So there really is this kind of lag where you might, we might have, the vehicle flew over it 12 hours ago, but you know, in the absence of any kind of onboard processing, which is an area of active research, you're not gonna really be able to, to know what you found until you're back in your bunk looking through it. In order to film and then retrieve the footage, the crew has to perform two acts, getting the AUV in the water and back out again, which are challenges in their own rights. The submarine is perfectly happy underwater. It's when it's at the air-water interface and there's waves kicking it around and you're on a boat trying to navigate around and get just right so the winds don't blow it away or the waves don't push it into the boat. It's a delicate dance. Was this just another job for you or was there something exciting for you about this? So my excitement has been tempered a little bit. The more I, I learned and the more I, I saw this shipwreck, uh, I, was, I got more and more excited. I was pretty lucky. I, I view it as being at the right place at the right time to be able to participate in the expedition. There's a variety of numbers that people have attributed to be what is on the shipwreck. And all of that stems, I believe, from ship's manifests and just guesswork. Did you guys have a security detail? We were on a Colombian naval vessel, so that kind of... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, with all the focus on that, the real value is in the, the cultural wealth. You know, it's, it's a piece of history that tells a story. Day after day, the crew went through their routine, hoist the AUV back on deck, review the files, and send it back out in the morning. Watching the endless motion of Caribbean waves sweep by Jeff reflected on his journey to get here. He'd been looking forward to the voyage since elementary school when he was assigned an essay. The prompt, where do you see yourself in 30 years? 
Jeff wanted to take after his childhood hero, Bob Ballard, who's worked at Huey since the 60s. Bob is known for discovering a handful of famous shipwrecks, including the Titanic, back in 1985. I said I wanted to work at Huey, so I, I sort of looked to his leadership and his ability to tell stories as something that I wanted to do. Here's an excerpt from Jeff's actual childhood essay. When I got my doctorate degree in oceanography, I moved to Woods Hole to work in their oceanography department. While I worked there, I discovered seven new fish species. I also helped find the Sovereign of the Seas, which sank in 2011. While on that expedition, I met another oceanographer named Ellen. We fell in love and got married January 28, 2012. After our marriage, we moved to Woods Hole. Is, is Ellen your wife's name by chance? Her middle name is Lynn. No, is that's pretty, pretty close. close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd totally forgotten about the part that talked about the finding a shipwreck in there as well. It was super strange. It means like, don't most kids want to go get their PhD at Duke and move to Woods Hole in, their, in fifth grade? Like, this is normal to me. Jeff's essay got surprisingly close to predicting his wife's future name. But what would come of his dream to find a shipwreck? As night fell on day 10 of the expedition, the crew settled into their bunks. Tomorrow, they'd be heading back home with no treasure to speak of. Just one less box in the grid to search. I think these kinds of things just teach you a patience and a cautious optimism. Three hundred years ago, the San Jose was en route to Cartagena with a cargo full of treasure and armed with 62 bronze cannons and 600 men. They were part of a 17-ship fleet carrying goods for trade fairs to generate income for Spanish merchants and King Philip V. But it wasn't long before news got out and a trap was set. On June 8, 1708, 30 miles from their destination, the fleet was attacked by the English Navy. Being enemies of King Philip V, the English sought to steal the revenues and destroy trade relations. The ocean-swept decks of the ships from both sides lay splattered with blood as the battle raged through the night. Then, in the early morning hours, a fire broke out on the San Jose, quickly sending the ship, along with most of its men and treasures, to the bottom of the sea, where, 300 years later, it was still yet to be found. Have you ever had any failed expeditions? It all depends on your definition of failure. What did Edison say? He found a lot of ways to not make a light bulb with the San Jose mission. The first time was a week and a half where we found where the San Jose wasn't. After five months away, the crew returned to Colombian waters. This time, they would be searching the second grid on the map. A few days in, the crew brought up the AUV and once again reviewed the data. We had a, a promising contact seen in, in the sonar images which is basically like a, a more interesting blur than the other blurs you've seen so far. So they, you know, you would command the vehicle to go do another mission to take some pictures. Um, and it's really those pictures which you're gonna give an archeologist or a, you know, a, a Joe Schmo like me who can you know, know what a shipwreck sort of looks like to be able to identify that. Our team leader had you know, given me the hard drive and said, go look at these in your bunk and let me know what you see. So I'd gone down and then was like paging through these images. And one of the first things I saw was it looked like a tube coming out of the seafloor. My initial reaction was, oh, you know, it's just some industrial site where something fell off a container ship or got pushed off or whatnot, since Cartagena is a pretty big port. So it's not uncommon to see uh, containers that might have just fallen off a container ship. A couple images later, I see, you know, four tubes which are very obviously canon. So that, that right there was kind of the moment when I was like, okay, this is, uh, I'm pretty sure we found it now. So what did you do? I, I kind of just sat in my bunk and appreciated the fact that I was the only person in the world who knew we'd found the shipwreck. What a moment. I had a pretty big shit eating grin on my face, I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you went out, who did you tell first? So it was right before dinner, so I, I went up to the mess hall and um, tried to really, you know, play it cool 
and my I sat across from our, our team leader and he looks at me and he's like, Do we do we find it? And I'm just like I'm sure you could tell by my giant grin that we had and I was like, Yeah, we found it, you know, like 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 it's nothing. <laughs> As Jeff explored the photos, he saw that the treasure wasn't actually up for grabs. It had already been claimed for hundreds of years. There is a lot of marine life that's, you know, made this artificial reef its home. So as to see these crabs and these fish that are living there, I mean, they don't put a, they put a different kind of value on a cannon or on a, a box full of gold. Like they're just, it's a home to them. They're not, um, you know, gonna like trade that for seashells. I don't know. That's so a great it's, image. It's cool. <laughs> there is so there is one cannon sticking up out of the seafloor, and every picture of that cannon, there is always a crab on top. So it's like that's his his little tower, his little piece of paradise there. <laughs> Always made me smile. A week later, the president of Columbia announced that the San Jose had been found. However, Jeff and his team members from Hui were asked to not comment on their involvement for three and a half years because of an ongoing legal battle. As of now, that fight over who owns the rights to excavate the shipwreck continues. We're not really interested in being branded as treasure hunters, and that's not in our mission at all. Our goal is to advance the state of the art in, in underwater technology and help with the storytelling. And this is one of humankind's history's great stories. I know how I felt looking at those pictures. And if you know, you're in a museum seeing the real thing, I think that would be really cool. I, I think that's, that's their intention. I really hope that it, uh, that it comes to fruition. When you're at a cocktail party and people ask what you do, I'm sure they ask for stories. Is this one of the stories you bring up? Yeah, um, I try not to be too big of a jerk about it, but <laughs> I have used the phrase underwater rocket scientist, and I think that's maybe <laughs> even, uh, even worse. So I well, love it, love it. <laughs> <laughs> Dreaming is a big part of my job, sort of more on the side than, than getting paid for it, but really thinking about what's going to be What's going to be the next big thing in uh, in oceanography and ocean technology? So that's that's a, I think that's a really cool position to be in. You get to choose your own adventure. Hey, it's Doug. Thanks so much for listening. When you get a chance, would you mind leaving a rating and review for the show? It only takes a few seconds, and it's a huge help. There are a ton of fun episodes coming up, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any. To watch a video version of the series, head over to facebook.com slash what we do docs. That's what we do, D-O-C-S. Until next time, stay curious. What We Do with Doug Frazier is distributed by WHRV for WHRO Public Media.